So yeah, go all on. right. Um, I'm Steph. Uh, it's me on the internet. <laughs> um, I don't actually look like that. I think, but so I've been thinking about changing my like online persona, but it feels weird. Like I didn't ever think I was gonna. Ch I would never change my own name, and this has just been my like icon forever. So it feels kind of. Like I'm getting plastic surgery, like for just vain reasons. So I figure I'll just leave it forever. And... Just slap the beard on it. Yeah, just like. <laughs> hey, that's a good point. That's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll do that. Do Although uh, my wife probably wouldn't like the semi-permanent nature of adding a beard. So, um, all right. So I, I'm Steph. Um, I'm from there in Canada, uh, the province of wheat, apparently. Um, I figure this is how Americans sort of can think about Canada. Um, uh, for the last few years, I actually lived in New York, so I escaped the province of wheat and went here. It was lots of fun, and uh, this year I actually moved uh, to the Bay Area, and it's great. Um, I took a job with Yahoo, and um, I'm having a good time. I'm glad you updated that to relatively new. Yeah, I was like, oh yeah, it's kind of relatively new. Uh, anyway, so my role at Yahoo is primarily a whole bunch of open source. So Yahoo has a large number of Ember applications as well as other JavaScript applications. And uh, they felt that it was valuable enough to have someone come down and work on this stuff. And uh, I'm having a great time, so that's good. Um, so in New York, I learned how to longboard. Uh, but when I came to, came to California, I told people I longboarded, they assumed I did this. So I figured to fix the ambiguity, I was going to learn how to do both types of longboarding. Uh, so I'm still, I can get up. I'm still kind of crappy at it, but it's lots of fun. Um, it's probably funner than longboarding on pavement because when you fall, you don't like rip all the skin off of your arms and knees. Um, uh, anyway, so that's fun. Uh, I like giving talks. Um, I also have a very patient wife who lets me do a lot of open source. Um, people who've seen my talks before, I have birds. We're crazy bird people. Uh, and we have a third one who just can't pair with me because he kills my headphones. I think I've gone through like several hundred dollars worth of headphones because of him already this year, so it's not good. Um, I also am on the Ember Core team. Um, one of my primary responsibilities there as of late has been working on Ember CLI. Um, fixing a lot of bugs, I complain a lot on Twitter. Uh, I'm actually a pretty happy guy, but I do complain a lot on Twitter, especially about NPM. Um, so overall, my goal is to constantly improve the framework. So rather than building just one tool in isolation, I'd much rather see the weight and the pains distributed across every part of the stack. So rather than putting too much work into just Ember CLI, if the problem can be solved better by solving it across 10 repos, I'd prefer to do that. So I like to look at the whole picture and see which part of the puzzle uh, needs to carry which part of the weight for the given problem. Um, and yeah, I get to work with a fun team. Recently, um, my, the latest addition is I started to attend TC39. So as a benefit of working at Yahoo, I get a seat on TC39. And uh, I have to say, um, I just talked about Yehuda, talked about this with Yehuda for some time. Who said, you know, if you're interested, this is probably something you should take. I was really apprehensive. I just imagined that I was going to sit. I like getting stuff done. I, I was just, I imagined that I'd go there and just like pull my hair out. But I have to say, having attended a one TC39 meeting, I really feel that the language and the ecosystem is actually in really good hands. There's a wide array, wide variety of people with different skill sets, different experiences, and different, um, uh, basically you can imagine there's very strong academics and very strong implementers, and they seem to work well together. So I, I have much more confidence after having attended one of them, and I hope it'll be many more. Um, so for the rest of the slides, assume this. Um, oh, as part of Ember 2.0, uh, we're hoping to slowly break up Ember into pure ES6 modules. So at first, this is going to allow people to um, at least be able to statically look at their source code and see which modules they import. But as we have time to refactor Ember, uh, and part of the packager work that actually enables the HTTP2 stuff, uh, we'll, we're aiming to do selective builds. So we're going to pull out the parts of Ember that you actually utilize. This is going to be an incremental process. It'll take some time. But um, yeah, so assume this for the rest of the slides. And uh, 
So at Yahoo, one of the neat things is they quite literally have hundreds of people. I mean, every day I find out more Ember apps are there than we possibly knew. They have hundreds of developers and working on Ember, and I get to see a lot of the common pain points. And I think the two biggest pain points today settle on needs between controllers and observers. Uh, and even worse is when you have needs and observers together. Um, Go back. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That should have been my, this is my talk title. Yes. <laughs> awesome. I wonder if the browser does the backwards letters. Anyways, we'll make it work. So, I've been commenting on PRs ever since I started, and when I tell people, hey, what if you didn't use an observer here? It usually turns into a very long comment thread about, well, what else do I do? So I say, hey, just come find me at my desk, and this is almost the first thing I tell them is, what if you were to program without observers? What would happen? So one of the ways to think about this is um, I've suggested to people, before they use an observer, assume that's going to cost them $20 per observer that they use. Uh, and if they do feel that their task really is worth $20, then maybe they can use an observer. Um, even though that's a small amount of money, if you have an app with hundreds and hundreds of observers that you added, or you have a for loop that goes and adds observers, you're going to think twice before doing this. I haven't been able to actually get a real observer jar, but um, maybe, maybe next quarter they'll have a budget for this. Um, so the first part, I think, when going through this conversation, uh, the first thing that we run into is like, well, what is the difference between Kimber Computed and Ember Observer? So who here, has a, who here, not Eric, has a really good guess, or has a good idea of what the difference is between computed properties and observers? Sean? All, all Ember computed are observers, not all observers are computed. Um, so in other words, uh, Ember, the computed uh, inherits from observer. Nope, but, but, but good try. So interestingly, um, I think some people get confused because of improper observer usages. Their computer properties start behaving like observers, but they're actually very different concepts. The observer is async. Happens outside the room. Uh, actually, incorrect. The observers sync, and it happens immediately. Okay. Um, the computed, computed actually just invalidates uh, the result, the cache result of a function call. Whereas observer, every time you change something that it's watching, it fires a function. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, any other more additional thoughts? I mean, like that's part of it. Yes, Eric. Computed's return values. Observers do not. Interesting. This is cool. Any other thoughts? All right. Well, confusingly, we probably made a mistake, and they look really, really, really similar, right? We and we absolutely made a mistake. And and not only that, but we like made them like siblings. So it's like, what's the cost difference between these two? And in basic scenarios, they they can be made to be more or less functionally equivalent. So the top one is a computed property called full that depends on first and last. And if first and last change, um, <coughs> then if full is ever um, evaluated, it will in fact be sort of the full name. Um, on the other side, we have the observer. Very similar pattern. Instead of returning something, oh, the observer does return something, but ignore that return. That's just wrong. Um, I thought you were going to point out and then cross it out. <laughs> Well, that's much easier to update, so I'll do that. Um, but instead of returning the value, you actually have to explicitly set the value. So if the observer is doing some work, you have to explicitly point it somewhere. Whereas the computer property, it just implicitly is the value of its computed result. But if we actually look at this a little bit closer, so we're going to create friend going forward is the computer property version. Foe is the observer version. So. This is the first sort of experience I think people have when they mix up the two, is they create an object, and the first one, well, it works. When you get full, it has a value. Uh, the second one, when you get full, there's no value. Right? So this clearly already indicates that computer properties and observers are very different concepts. But why? So attributes passed into the create are part of sort of the initial state of an object. And we don't emit change events for the initial state of the object because it hasn't changed. It just, it just happens to begin life as first name Steph, last name Penner. Um, if in fact those change, we'll then send change events. 
So that should probably hint as to why the computer property version worked, but the observer did not. So yeah, there is in fact a way to uh, give, computer, give observers a kick. You can use the on syntax to say on init, which confusingly is actually on after init, um, trigger this observer. So It was called after init originally. And it probably should have continued to be called after init. Um, so changes after init cause change events to fire. So remember, if we pass information in via create, nothing happens because that's the initial state of the object. But if we change information in on init, which is actually after init, change events do fire. This has some performance implications that some people may not be aware of, but it's a little unfortunate. And then, because change events fire, the observers fire. But we did the on, right? So great, our, our foe works fine. We have made computer properties and observers the same. Who cares? Success, done. But if we take a little bit of a closer look at this example, they are not functionally equivalent. So to do this, I'm gonna add a little bit of logging. So when the computed property gets computed, I'm going to log computed friend full. If the observer fires, I'm going to log computed foe full did change. And as we can see, we create the object. And then when I eventually do get full, it computes and gives me the value. In the world of observers, with the on init, before it did nothing. Now with the on init, it fires eagerly. Which is a little bit strange, but you know, it kind of makes sense. But this really breaks down the difference between computer properties and observers. Observers are eager and computer properties are on demand. Computer properties are very pay as you go versus observers, they incur the penalty up front. But what's really wrong with that? Well, let's add yet another dependent property into this mix. So whenever full changes, we actually want to just get the reverse of full and that's going to be the value for reversed. We'll do the same for the observer case. And again, because computer properties return values but observers do not, we have to set the value from the observer case. So this is the computer property scenario. Basically just in time, just as I need it, the computer property does the work, gives me the value it's for full, and it does the same thing for reverse. But in the observer case, even before I even care about getting reversed, reverse is calculated and um, the full is calculated. And now when you have only a few models, this probably just really doesn't make a difference. But everyone who says that is basically lying because basically instantaneously they have 4,000 Ember data models that they load. So now where you had three extra things happening, you now have 12,000 extra things happening. And that's where you start having some pretty serious performance problems. So observers really have huge work amplification potential, which means if you're not careful, they can really troll you. But so far, we've seen that you can make computer properties and observers be somewhat functionally equivalent, and computer properties have so far none of the same caveats as observers do. So we have proven observers and computer properties are not the same thing. Observers are eager. So part two of this, there's another weird quirk of how observers work, and they're kind of hostile when you think about data consistency. And I had this realization by accident a few times, but really realized this in a recent bug I helped debug at work. But in this example, I change first name, I change last name, and when I get full, I in fact find, oh, that's not right. <laughs> it should be Eric Brynjolfsson there, my bad. But the computer property works as expected, my example just merely is wrong. But if we look at the observer version, as soon as I set first, anything that listens to full, like reversed, fires and computes. And for a short period of time, we have Eric Penner. And I don't think my wife or Eric's girlfriend would approve of this. Um, but in fact, the Ember app doesn't care and doesn't realize. Now, most of the time, your Ember app, you don't even notice that this is happening because when you do the second set, the next one updates, and if your application's fast enough, you don't care. 
but occasionally people will actually put logic inside of a computer property, like an if statement or inside of an observer. And it'll actually calculate some random intermediate result and make a choice. And fun stuff happens. Um, ultimately, when I set last to Brynn Rolfsson, um, reverse is correct in this example. It's also correct. So it turns out when you're using observers, you can accidentally have an eventually consistent um, and in a very unexpected system. This is a lot of extra work. Clearly, we should only have wanted to consume reversed once. Uh, but in fact, we computed reverse twice. Shrinking concatenation isn't a big deal, but if your computer properties are firing AJAX requests, that might not be fun. Here's a quick example. If in fact we had an observer that for some reason had an if statement and make, made an uh, uh, invocation change based on the conditional, you could totally imagine that very strange things um, can happen here. Now, there is a s scenario solving solution fix, and that is object set properties. Um, but this only works for the scenarios that you can see immediately in one run to completion of a function. In many complicated applications, you'll actually have properties changing all over the place. Um, and sometimes it's impossible to sort of group them together. But it's actually possible if you're using a primarily computed property-based system just to ignore this concept altogether. There is also a secondary solution, and that's potentially to make run loop aware or async observers. But if we don't need them, why add the extra complexity when computer properties handle it all just fine? Or better yet, let the system be lazy, like computer properties inherently are. The third thing here is context is extremely important. I don't know, can you guys read that from where you are? All right, so. So we have a client, they say, well, we have this input when someone types in there, I want you just, it, it's supposed to autosave. So the first naive implementation is, okay, so whenever foes first does change, I'm gonna instantly say save. Well, the first problem is every keystroke saving kind of sucks. You don't want to spawn AJAX requests for everything. So an obvious fix is, all right, we're just going to debounce it every two seconds, or at, at most every two seconds, save it. Um, and to be pedantic, when we have a debounce, we have to actually be sure to cancel our debounce so that our tests don't leak the bounces. Just a friendly reminder. Um, so that all works. That's fantastic with the debouncing. But then a, another feature request appears and the product owner is like, well, you know what's really cool? When everything updates all the time because of WebSocket pushes. So you add a WebSocket push to the mix, but now your observer from before has no idea why foo's first has changed. So now every time a WebSocket push request comes in, your save will fire. And basically the only benefit of this is your system will in fact always stay in sync because you're constantly, every two seconds, doing an update of your system. But it's probably not what you actually want. Um, and people say, well, you know, I'll be careful, but once upon a time at a specific company who I won't mention, um, and only in Bangalore, a moment JS date range generation plus observer cycle happened. And this meant the browser only in Bangalore would lock up for 30 minutes every time something happened. And it was basically observer to observer plus a date glitch in moment JS that meant we'd generate like we would generate 60 years of date ranges by accident. Um, and it was basically the, that problem where like, you can be careful and this will work for a long period of time. This code was months or probably even a year old, but someone, somewhere, somewhere added something and it caused this cycle to occur. Um, and it was like an emergent property of the system. It didn't even realize that this prob problem happened, except for the poor staff in Bangalore who couldn't get any work done for, for far too long. Um, if the system was built using computer properties, this problem just would never have happened. It just wouldn't have been a thing. You wouldn't have had to be nearly as careful. The other scenario is with observers doing computation, you have lost the context. You don't know why it changed. So in the case of the moment JS code generation, we didn't realize that it was actually just another observer telling us to do something and then we told it to do something. We had lost that context. One way we can restore context is actually by using the bindings down, actions up thing that we learned from React. Um, and instead of using an observer to observe the change of some information, um, we can just use an action which has all of the context as to why something happened to trigger the change. So in this case, again, 
the observer concept just doesn't exist, it's functionally equivalent. And when someone in the future decides to add WebSocket syncing, your app doesn't go into a loop of constantly saving itself. And again, we did it to balance, so we should be pedantic and make sure that we actually cancel the, um, the save when the object in question is destroyed. So I've been playing with this one a bit, but another problem with observers is very similar to the law of Demeter. So who here isn't familiar with the law of Demeter? Okay, so the TLDR of the law of Demeter is your object should only talk to the things that they know, their direct neighbors. They shouldn't reach far across the ecosystem to uh, tweak some information. So basically, um, the further from your own object you reach, the more brittle your system is to change. So imagine you have a car um, who has a dealer, who has an employee, and if a human reaches and asks via the car to the human to the dealer to do something, if any name along the path changes, if anything changes, the whole system breaks. So it's usually better to try and do local modifications and then delegate. Um, with observers, this, this problem is pretty much the same. So here's a pretty clear example of something that's kind of crazy. When you have two controllers and you're actually observing far into each controller, if that path ever changes, so imagine, for example, friends becomes companions, um, you change from a Facebook to a dating site, for example, um, your code would just stop working and you'd have absolutely no idea why it would stop working. Um, so anyone else see some issues with this particular example? Any, anything else? <laughs> at each works. No? Your controller is an array. If it's, because the friends at each, then your friend's controller would have to be an array controller. Is that... No, no. So, so remember, observers, so assuming that I didn't typo controllers, that stop statement is more or less okay, but for every full that changes, we're going to immediately call friends did change. Uh, you're saving on um, mass changes will fire multiple saves on the whole collection. Correct. Yeah. So as you do a push and you update a bunch of people's first full name, you're actually going to get one save for all of them for each time you update one of them. So if you update a whole list of them, you're going to have another crazy amplification of, of work. Um, so as we saw... Uh, the, the solution to this is to use the run loop to defer it. Uh, but again, that's kind of a hacky workaround. What would be nicer is just to fall back to the actions up bindings down scenario and have actual context. So when a user goes and presses save, when they do a batch update, that save is the thing that triggers the invoke save, not some random property that you don't know why it changed causing the change. And this code is, is pretty common to see. I, in fact, have written this code myself in the past. Um, and then the bugs happen, and I feel bad. Um, so sometimes maybe we can convince ourselves that using observers is actually a good idea. Um, why on earth are observers in Ember in the first place if they're so bad? Well, they're kind of like, if you don't really know what to do with data binding, they are kind of a data binding hammer primitive. Um, but uh, as we learn, very few things are actually truly nails or specific to observers. And it turns out using observers is crazy hard. Um, if, you use, if you look at Ember's only real internal usages of observers, they have many guards and many checks and many run loop schedules, and they're not obvious to use. But in most scenarios, if you swap that observer to be a computer property and or you change the reason why data is changing to an action, observers just disappear and you have less code, easier to test, easier to maintain, way less bugs, and easier to grok. Um, but in fact, at this point in time in Ember, there are still some scenarios where an observer might be the best tool for the job. And an example of this is um, if data changes and we need to push out of Ember. So we need to push to something like D3 that isn't really aware of how Ember does its change observation. 
Um, we have to, in fact, use an observer to detect that a change occurred. But because observers fire synchronously, if the data changes multiple times, we don't actually want to incur the penalty of rendering multiple times because we know that we want to let the data settle down first, and then we can do one final render. So to accomplish that, inside of the observer, we do an ember run, schedule once, and then finally, when that all settles down, it does a draw. But in the draw, it actually checks to make sure that the component is in DOM. Because as soon as you introduce a little bit of async, like schedule once does, run loop async, um, there's actually the chance that by the time the callback draw gets invoked, that some part of the system has decided that this component is no longer rendered and should be removed. And at that point in time, we need to be careful and actually we need to we need to avoid telling D3 to do anything because it is entirely invalid to do. So if in fact observers are used today, you have to be extremely careful. If you ever see an observer that doesn't have very strict guards and run loop scheduling, it is guaranteed a problem spot. And in theory, you can probably remove it entirely, but sometimes when you're interacting with external um, libraries like D3, they're a sort of necessary evil for now. So when you see this, it's messy, it's hard to reason about, um, there actually is something we could likely desugar it to, and that's render observer. Um, and maybe if you're stuck on older versions of Ember, this is something that you should consider. Uh, but as we move to Glimmer and as we move to Ember 2.0, there's a new series of hooks that your component will be um, invoked with when specific lifecycle changes occur. Um, the link at the bottom is to the blog post where we talk about the initial iteration of these hooks. Um, but what these hooks enable is actually, even when interacting with D3, an entirely observerless world. Purely the framework will call you at the right point in time. You won't need to write all these extra crazy checks. It will only call you once, and then you can do your render. Um, so in that world, when that work lands, that crazy complicated function you saw with the various edge cases will basically be replaced by something that's this simple. Um, which leads Ember into the world of basically no observers are necessary. Um, so for the time being, when you are interacting with some external thing like D3, observers might be a necessary evil, but maybe we can abstract it into something that's a little bit more resilient and terse. Um, and then at the point in time where these features land, um, we can hopefully pull out those observers entirely and live in a world that we can reason about in a reasonable way. So if in fact you are using observers, these are basically the rules that you have to take into account. You want to always push data out of Ember because if you push it back into Ember, meaning you do another property set, you might be invoking someone else's observer that might then in fact call you or cause other side effects. This is that amplification problem, which can cause performance problems and bugs. Um, Another important thing is if in fact you have to use an observer, you also must schedule for laziness. You must use um, schedule, ember run schedule. Um, otherwise what might happen um, is if your observer is consuming other computer properties, they will also become synchronous. So they will start exhibiting similar behaviors as observers because the observer fires synchronously and then synchronously gets the computer properties, they will start doing intermediate work that they really don't need to do. So the trick is, if your observer fires, schedule the work to happen a little bit later, which should allow all your data to settle down, and then compute once, so you get that one consistent value rather than some strange intermediate one. And in some cases, most cases, like in the D3 example, we actually want to make sure that once per run loop is the only time that we actually render it. We don't want to accidentally render multiple times as we do data munging. And finally, and likely the most complicated part is when you, in fact, you are using observers, um, being aware of the life cycles at play, so in a view, your view can be in DOM, not in DOM, destroyed. You have to be aware of when you actually want the work to be, to be done. So in the case of a component, you have to always guard the in DOM scenario. Um, but the nice thing is, coming soon, you just won't need to use that at all. And it's, it's in beta right now. It's in beta right now. It'll be stable in two days, right? So. <laughs> um, this talk is almost uh, antiquated. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is there's massive amounts of code that already exists that's written like this. Um, so yeah, remember actions up, bindings down, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me right now or 
on Twitter. So any questions? Sean, any questions? I've always got questions. So, so basically, to sum it up, you can basically do a direct swap with a computed property or with an action that, that, that bubbles up. Yeah. I, except in the scenario where you're pushing out of Ember, right, 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 right. Um, there's like a sort of ongoing challenge with people in and around me at work to try and find a scenario that doesn't actually end up being nicer in this in this pattern. It may result in some larger factorings. And the other thing that's really important is when you have things that consume, like shared components, they must also be lazy. Otherwise, they just, they just like, they poison your whole application to be in this world of synchronous. So sometimes you might have to do some low level work in those shared components, and all of a sudden you release the entire application from this horrible burden it once had. Um, Question about like well, it's not necessarily about the observable something other or observes it's something else you mentioned about like not reaching too far in your application. Yeah. Is needs something that we should stop? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a new thing. Ember inject. So. Like so for for sharing state sessions, um, shared caches, things like that. Yeah. So Ember 2.0, as it's you may have heard, controllers are a thing of the past basically. Um, Yes, 2.x, let's say that. Um, controllers are a thing of the past. You can actually start writing your code pre-2.0 without controllers, except if you need query params. That's the only scenario where you need them. Um, people often like to say, well, Ember is leaving the MVC world. But actually, Ember used to not have routes. We used to just have controllers for routes. But we realized that there's some time of work that really makes more sense as routes. So we specialized a controller. We made a route. and. What Ember 2.0 or 2.1 or 2.x is doing is they're actually taking a controller and they're specializing it into two different things and dropping the concept of controller. There is a service and a component. What this really boils down to is lifecycle. So if your controllers that are backing templates have a longer lifecycle than the templates, you carry state around for a much longer period of time. And that's somewhat strange. You end up having these cleanup methods to go and clean up your controller when you come back. Wouldn't it be nicer just to throw away your controller when you're done with it and then create a new one when you need a new one? Um, and once that realization was made, we realized that if the top level view became a component, that would be one to one with what a controller would be. Why would we need to have two concepts that describe the same thing? So the controllers that governed view or template lifecycle, they become components. Now, other controllers, um, they govern more stateful things, like for example, a user session, and that session will survive for a long period of time, or some search information or some time information. Well, those should likely not be directly reflected um, in a template of their own. So they become services. Those are non-template backed controllers, basically, but that have a very long life cycle and they're singletons. Now, from a component now, you might ask, well, I have in fact a session controller, but at the top of my page, I have a um, I displayed the username and their current login status. This is a state that comes from the uh, user session service, for example. And that's where what Eric just said comes into play, where um, ember.inject allows you to inject services onto non-singleton things. So it lets you create a one-directional link back down. So the service isn't really aware of the component, but the component has a back reference to the service. And this is how, in fact, you could have um, a user, a current user component um, that just ambiently via the injection from the user session uh, be aware of what the user's name is. But when that particular part of the view gets unrendered, it goes away. And then when it gets re-rendered, it just gets the link again and it gets the data. So with this clean separation, as you're navigating through your application, hopefully all of the previous places where state might linger just disappear. And now state becomes something that is entrenched with the life cycle of the thing it's truly representing. So a really horrible performance implication of the current scenario is often when people feel their Ember app is slow, it isn't actually rendering the next page, it's deleting the one that you're leaving. So because we're reusing these controllers, there's that typically people end up writing a cleanup method that goes and cleans up the controller. Well, the controller's still active, which means change events fires, which means if you have observers in your system or templates observing, there's side effects. There's like a big explosion of changes only to delete the page. So you're just about to delete it. You go and clean up stuff, and all of a sudden, 
everything comes to life only to die right away. But there's an optimization that Ember has, and that is as soon as you destroy an object, it goes dead. So in this world where we drop those controllers, and we just have components, when we delete the tree, everything more or less just goes dead and it doesn't incur this massive performance penalty. Um, and then there's also some consistency differences that are quite nice because we don't reuse state. We kind of know that regardless of which angle we come at a route at, so for example, imagine we have post one, comment two, um, we can navigate directly to the comment, the deeply nested comment, or to the post. We now know that state isn't lingering around, so it should be more resilient to be able to handle different entry points into the application. Sorry, that was a little bit long-winded, but I hope it answered your question. So the, the short version, I would say, is it was about needs. So there is a new replacement if you have controllers still. There's Ember Inject Controller. So you can just go and remove needs and use that without changing anything else but you should move towards services. You should move towards the reality is that's merely a stepping stone, and it's, it only exists because we need compatibility for controllers, but controllers themselves are going away. But you should really view that transition as being no better than the existing needs transition, basically. Um, it's really just a, you can move to the new syntax and then get the leads to starting to migrate towards services, which has basically just a one word difference between that syntax. Yeah, but you want to think about your controllers as two different things today. The ones that are ambient, but not tied directly to, to a template, and the ones that are tied to a template, and that will make your transition to a pure component-based world very simple. Uh, and you can do that even before the top-level groundable components exist. It becomes a quite nice refactoring, uh, and it makes your app faster, easier to test, and upgrading will be much easier. Uh, any other questions? So the, the findings now and actions, I fully understand the reasoning. Why? Why, why you're going that way. But I'm curious if there's going to be any changes to enhance ergonomics when it comes to that. Because, for example, right now with two-way binding, if I have a component that, let's just say, all it does is, is track my mouse position while I'm over top of it, and then by, like with two-way binding, sets some, set some value, like the x and y value uh, that, that, it, that it's tracking. I can then take that x and y value and bind it anywhere else in that same template because it's going out to that scope, and it's fairly ergonomic to do that. But if I have to, if I have to use an action, then I have to set this action on my component. I have to go implement the action in my uh, parent component or controller, and then I have to then write whatever I'm, I'm right. Do you understand what I'm? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of there's extra work all of a sudden to, to do that same sort of thing that was very easy to do. Yeah, so remember my law of Demeter slide where like you shouldn't really reach too much into the system? There's like explicit law of Demeter violations where like you're calling a you're calling your neighbor and then directly referencing its neighbor and further and further and then calling a method. There's also, I think, like implicit law of Demeter violations, and that is when you have a fully data-bound, two-way bound system where one change not only changes its direct sibling, but it has massive side effects throughout the application. So clearly, if you lived in a, if you worked, um, if you programmed in a system where you couldn't talk to your own neighbor, everything becomes extremely complicated. And I suspect in this world, that's exactly the same case. So if in fact you have a two-way binding that is encapsulated to a very small region of space and its side effects are controlled, um, I think it's actually a good pattern. So the plan is, um, and Eric, you can tell me the current state of this. Basically, there's a mute helper which allows you to opt in to two-way binding. But because it's opt-in, you have to opt-in at every layer. So it doesn't, by default, cause massive changes throughout your entire code base. So for example, in the case where you want to have a component who has an X and Y, and you know for a fact you just want the ambient environment to be bound to X and Y, you can explicitly, it's like a handlebars helper that lives as the first argument to the curlies. It just says mute. And, um, it creates that two-way binding. Because I do agree, if you have a form with a whole bunch of inputs, it'd be really crazy to have one action per input and then synchronize stuff. So having the mute as an opt-in allows, um, I think, exactly what you were asking for. We, we also have another cool thing, which is that, so in the future, or in the very near future, you know, I think you're gonna see most add-ons and stuff are going to be written for one-way binding, so add data down actions up, and so, you're going to want sometimes to, like you said, it's very convenient to just be able to have two-way binding. And the, what happens is with this, you know, one of the first things we thought when we started looking at this, like, you know, the React style was like, oh, man, there's so much boilerplate just to take what is a simple property setting 
and like you got to write a bunch of actions now. There's a whole bunch of boilerplate actions that all they do is sit this dot set whatever. Well, we actually have wrapped up a nice little combo. There's an action mute combo that you can use, and you can actually pass a mute to an action. Or like so, let's say your component fires an action for change. You can actually pass like a mute uh, wrapped action to that, and it will actually generate you that setter function and just set the property name that you have pass in. There, there'll be, there might actually be a demo of that on the blog post already, on a, on a recent blog post, but we can, I can track you down that information if you're interested. But yes, we're definitely, the idea is that you can turn what was, what used to be... Extremely verbose code into not extremely verbose yeah, code. Basically, basically, we can generate, you the thing you're talking about, like you have to write an action, and all it's doing is setting a property that you know you want to set anyways. We can make that, it's like a few extra characters basically uh, in the template. We can like basically generate that function for you. We generate an action for you, basically, that sets the name of the property that you tell us to. And so that's basically how in a one in a world of purely data down actions up, you can still emulate to a binding. You pass in the initial value, right? So you'll have like input value equals, you know, my name or whatever. And then you have on you know, input or on change or whatever the event name is or the action name that you want that's what that component is going to fire, mm -hmm. you provide to it a, um, like basically uh, Curly's, I believe it's Curly's action, and then you give you uh, the sub-expression syntax, mm -hmm. the parens mute the name of the property that you want it to change. So like, does your my name. example come with syntax highlighting? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's a little bit of a mind warp the first time you think you see it, but it gives you this pattern without all the boilerplate, basically. Mm -hmm. Aaron, how does that effectively work too for uh, situations where, for example, with the, with, uh, the graphs, you know, there's a situation where if the graph on the right, and the, the graph on the right and the graph on the left both have their own scale, but their scales are linked to where if suddenly this one spikes up, I need to inflate the scale of my, the domain values of my graph on this side, my min and max values, but I also need to tell its its uh, sibling graph, which is a component in and of itself. Hey, yeah, I mean our, your scale needs to change to what mine is. Right? So I mean, usually in a case like that, I mean, if this is a little in the weeds, but basically the idea is like usually with components, you have a parent who's responsible for you know managing shared state between them. Right. Basically, anything that's common needs to hoist to a common parent, right. so that you can pass that value across because components right now can't talk directly to each other if they're siblings. They have to communicate through a parent. And so basically, this, you know, if what you have now is basically those two components have like a domain, some kind of domain-related binding that their parent gives both of them, and that's how they communicate their domain changes to each other, then you could, yes, just change that to the same shorthand. Or perhaps a better situation might be to just have them fire like an on-domain change event that their parent handles and then does some stuff. Because sometimes, you know, one of the things that's really annoying with this kind of like, it totally is easy to like wire these things together. I think the short answer is, I suspect, yes, there is a good no, solution a for solution, it. But the um, idea is that sometimes you want to actually like look at the intermediate value and control what is actually set. So that becomes easier when you have an action kind of as an intermediary to the real property set. So anyways. I think the, so there's a lot of talk about unidirectional data flow models. And I think they really work well when you look at a large system because you don't want contamination and propagation and amplification problems. But sometimes in some very small scenarios, the bidirectional or emulated bidirectional is exactly what you want. You just don't want it to also escape out of that context. So um, I think in the world of immutable data structures and two-way or one-way data bindings, there's a hybrid model that really does make sense where you use the right tool for the right job, but use the right tool in the right way. So pre-2.0 Ember, we used two-way bindings in the wrong way, and it would cause amplification and um, just strange problems. By changing it to be opt-in, we sort of clamp down the side effects that are potential. Um, while still benefiting from some of the ergonomics that happen, and then using actions, maybe we'll discover a even better, more wonderful way of doing this. Um, any any other questions? You guys are ready to go. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for listening to me, and hopefully those questions and the talk was useful.